All right, guys, how you doing? So, you know, I always wonder, like I can barely see unless I stand like this the entire time, which is really quite unfriendly, so I will try not to do that. Um, so I have to say thank you, actually, to all the people who have spoken before me because, wow, you're such smart people. I really appreciate it because I, I always leave conferences like, like this, basically going like, I can take off. Like any minute now, I just feel so inspired. So thank you for all the wonderful talks. Um, to Chris, who spoke about reflection, which I think is so important, and <laughs> I'm going to smile and look at Kate as I say this, because um, her story about Anne, how many of you got a little teary? Right? Like you're watching it, and you're like, almost at first there's a bit of discomfort, because you're like, oh my god, is she going to start tearing up? Because she had, did anybody notice how perfect her makeup was? And how purple everything was? I, I don't know. I happen to notice her nails were purple too. You got to pay attention, people. So I just loved it. But then she starts to get tearing up, and I'm like, oh my God, don't tear up because I'm going to tear up. Those are moments, I know, and <laughs> I'm smiling because obviously Kate teared up too. But those are moments that I want us to soak into because that really was a perfect segue into my talk. I'm also going to very politely tell you that I'm not competitive. I think my nose is growing as I say this. Because I smiled because Kate said, well, <laughs> we're talking about the UK government and they're bonkers. I'm in from the United States. I say no more. I, I think we might actually have you up on that one. I don't want to be competitive or anything, but just a wee bit. But let's move on. So I'm here to talk to you about qualitative research. I am a research nerd snob. Anybody, how many, you, how many researchers in the audience, just so I get a sense of who I'm talking to? So a few of you, okay, so researchers unite, right? This is all about research, and it's bringing a little bit more about a credibility lens on research. This is also government-based, so as cuckoo, as the US government might, might be right now, I live in the fabulous city of Boston. How many have been to Boston? Pretty decent city. I'm originally Canadian, and I love it because it feels like home, actually. So Boston, um, fabulous city, is going through a bit of a challenge right now. And let's see if I can advance my slide. Oh, there it is. OK, it took a moment. So. We did a project, and what I'm going to actually do in the course of this next 40 minutes is actually go through this project with you. And the reason is, is I really want to talk about how to do good qualitative research. So qualitative research really relates back to that moment of emotion, that moment of humanness that we saw with Anne as she shared her story about what was important to her. If you had received the same story as a designer, and the story went like this, which was, Anne needs to actually create a next of kin situation legally. She doesn't know what to do. There's your scenario. Go agile, go forth and conquer. It's not going to mean as much to you. But the moment you hear it in Anne's voice, the moment you hear it with the emotion, with what it really meant for her, and the fact that I thought it was quite cool that the thank you sort of came as an afterthought, but it really was impacting her. You realize that you're designers for a reason. And I believe that research gives you that platform for those stories. But here's the deal. A story can be well told and it can also be poorly told. If we have poorly told stories, how many of the researchers out there have ever had the situation where research is sort of cast aside because it's more work and these damn humans are so hard to understand and it's just so ambiguous that I can't deal with this. Does that happen to anybody? Right? And that's the kind of situation we were trying to avoid. So, here in the story, working with the mayor's housing innovation lab. So Boston is in the middle of a housing crisis right now. Housing crisis meaning there's a lot of high income housing, million, million and a half, two-bedroom, two-bath condos in the middle of Boston. And then there's a lot of low-income housing. But the middle-income population is struggling because they sort of don't fit. 
And so they're slowly being driven out of the city. The mayor's <clears throat> housing innovation lab had a challenge in front of them, and they had to actually build policies for preventing this from happening. Coming up with new housing options for people. As you can imagine, they have numbers out the wazoo. Demographics more so than you can believe. People defined by numbers. Are you in a 1,200 square foot apartment? How many people live there? What's your income? We have lots of numbers. But what they didn't have access to was emotions. I think you guys might agree with me that apart from your own family, talking about your home is a very personal thing. And somehow what we wanted to do was bring that information closer. So our mayor, we're going to say his name properly, it's not Marty, it's Maddie. Maddie Walsh decided that, you know what, what we need to do is actually get some insight into people's lives and their lifestyles. So basically, what the city needed to hear was a lot more stories about people and their lifestyles. And that was incredibly important because it wasn't enough to just have all of this quantitative data. They needed far more than that. And as you can imagine, it's not to say that quantitative data is not necessary or it's not to say that it's, um, it's rendered useless, but we can actually bring more meaning to it if we have stories. Stories about real people. Story, stories about why people actually choose to live where they live and what drove those choices. Because as you can imagine, if you even think for a moment, you close your own eyes and you think about your lovely home and where you live, there's a reason why you live there. There's a reason why you chose it. A home is a very, very special thing and it protects us. So it's far more than just 2,400 square feet, right? At the crossroads of two special streets that you live on, it's far more than that. And what we wanted to do was get behind that. The challenge is, as you can imagine, no government ever goes, yeah, let's go out and talk to people and it's okay because we don't do it all the time. Governments don't really operate that way. So back to the bonker statement, I don't think they're bonkers. They're very, very nervous, actually. They're very, they sort of tread very lightly in terms of that concept of qualitative research. So as you can imagine, the Housing Innovation Lab folks, who I have the highest regard for, said, we want to do this, but we've got to be honest with you here. We have to be transparent because this is public money. They need to know what we're doing with their money. We have to be transparent and we must have structure to the process. I just want to focus on those two words for a second. Research is one of those things that often when it is included, if you even look into your own practices or look at people who you might have received research from, a lot of times it's done quite haphazardly. Sort of like, oh, we need to ask people a bunch of questions. So, hey, you guys, right up here, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions because you're in front of me and it's easy. Or let's go to the same five people that we've always gone to before and let's ask them. And the challenge there is our practices as a discipline have been a bit wonky, for lack of a better word. So their ask for transparency and their ask for structure came to music, as, as music to our ears, basically. We were like, rock on, we can totally do this with you. The other aspect here is, is transparency is really important, but transparency is not the kind of thing, if you think about it, it's not the kind of thing that you can say, I'm gonna run away and get stories and come back and tell you all these stories and you're gonna know what happened. Transparency means those people are with you all the time. You're shepherding them through a research process so that they can be a part of the action and hear the stories. We always like to say, you go watch a show on Broadway. If you watch it and you're there in that experience, you come away feeling something. If somebody just tells you about how awesome Hamilton was, it's wonderful, but can you feel the same thing that they felt? It's not quite the same. So our goal here is to make them feel those stories 
And the wonderful thing about Marty Walsh and his team is they were very serious about that. So we loved it. So enter Twig and Fish, fabulous research practice in Boston. Yes, we are research nerd snobs, that term coined by my colleagues, our Lulu Dean. And the two of us take research seriously. We love doing it, we love human stories, we love talking about it, but there's a caveat. The caveat is it needs to be well-structured. It needs to be transparent, and it needs to give people a window into exactly what is happening so that every point in time they understand guys, we're dealing with humans here. We're not the most predictable people all the time. There's going to be some abstractness to this process. And we want you to understand this as we go through. We have tons of fun. We have a lot of different companies that we work with. And we were really honored to work with the city of Boston. So our goal was basically to go through a five-phased research process. And in doing so, we wanted to share and almost reveal the value of qualitative research. What could it possibly do? Because whatever we brought back to the table, it was not only going to inform something as basic as what could housing configurations be? How might somebody want their house to be configured? What would make it more affordable? What might make it more interesting to them and more welcoming? But it also was gonna be very important in terms of housing policies that came forward. So this was not just for one sort of slant of information. There were so many different aspects that we were trying to focus on. The goal here was to go through five phases and to take the people with us through those five phases in great detail. And what I'd basically like to do is to share that detail with you guys. Let's start in a line. Our challenge was that the people that we were working with were fairly unfamiliar to human-centered research. Not so much in that they don't understand it, but, okay, we're going to be getting back a lot of stories. How do we make sense out of all of this information? How do we actually communicate this to other people? What do we do with it? How are we going to analyze it? And, you know, the questions start flying out in every direction, and they're great questions. So we said, we got you here. We're going to bring you through this process with us, and we're going to first start by aligning on study goals. Not sure how many of you get to do this with your stakeholders, but a lot of times when people want to do research and they have questions in their mind, they might not be very good at asking the right question. It's a simple thing, but it makes a huge difference. So the first thing we said is, let's get all your questions together. Let's align. Let's make sure everybody's on the same page. And as ridiculous as that sounds, it actually paves the process forward for a very, very good research by aligning first. The second thing we did was something that Chris spoke about, which is reflection. Look at what you guys are doing today. How are you getting those human stories today? In a lot of government situations, the answer is we're not. We're actually not getting them. And I don't know about you, but you got to know about people if we're talking about homes. So it was very impactful to them to go, OK, let's align first. Let's reflect on our practices. And we take them through a workshop by which we actually plot on a very fun two by two. Who doesn't love a good two by two? Come on, really, seriously? Right? We take them through a, a workshop and basically get them to sort of start to really soak into their questions. This is probably the wordiest slide that I have, so I apologize. But I wanted you to see some of the questions that they came up with. Common behaviors and drivers of housing choices. Common motivations, pain points, goals for living in the city of Boston. This is one of my favorite questions was, what does affordable look like to the middle income? First of all, we had to back them up a little bit and say, what is middle income? I don't know about you, but I don't go up to people and go, hi, my name's Mina, I'm middle income sort of not how I tend to introduce myself. It's a very hard thing. I don't even know what the hell middle income is. And quite honestly, I don't think they did either. They had a whole bunch of numbers, but the question is, what happens if I have a number and it's like the nine and the zero that's actually separating me and I'm like nine and a half? Like, where do I belong? Now there's this anxiety of where do I belong? We're not going to start that. So what does that actually mean? 
What are housing necessities? What does that word necessity mean? What are things that you will not bend over on? And what are things that are sort of eh? And we loved it because when we spoke to people afterwards and they're talking about things, sometimes we'd get the eh answer, which I always love. What the hell does that mean? But the thing is, we needed to dig deep into these things because we can't be making assumptions. We needed to be grounded. What are housing necessities beyond the scale of that concept of a home unit? And ultimately, what is the configuration of a, very big air quotes, middle income home? And how could we actually think about different options ultimately for the design team to come up with thoughts for configuration? Here's where I think research makes all the difference. Don't forget that there are gonna be consumers of this information. The design team always does better when they're anchored in a human story. It makes all the difference. So the next step, if you will, the next stage is plan. Now we're all aligned, we're all on the same page, and now the work starts. Plan really gets us into all of those details of who are we gonna study? What are we gonna talk to them about? How are we gonna even engage with these people? What might be important to them? How will we even find them? And one big aspect, I have to smile, I've been seeing this lovely woman take pictures of everybody because I've been sitting right there and I just wanna do this for the fun of it, just to make her picture a little bit different. <laughs> Anyhow, I just had to do that, sorry. So. In plan, the one challenge that the government came, the guys at the Housing Innovation Lab came back to us and said, you know, this is not gonna be enough for us to just talk to people. We really wanna go into their context. We wanna go into their homes and we wanna be in person with them. We loved it, it was music to our ears again, but you can imagine, this is somebody's home and if you're talking to them about their home, how willing will they be to let us in? And especially because we're from the government. But what we did was we were successfully able to do this and said, okay, you do realize this is gonna be more expensive. The moment you have to go into people's home, you have to go into context, it's gonna be a little bit more taxing in terms of the effort to find these people who are gonna allow us in. The key here, even though super structured across the top, we were not dogmatic in our approach. We said, okay, what can we do right now with your current budget? And what we decided to do was scale it back to a pilot for multiple reasons. First, to be able to actually go into people's homes. But second and most importantly, was for the city to get a flavor for what this was going to yield them. If they had that flavor, then they're like, now we can get a sense for this based on a pilot and then we can do more of this. Totally fair. People have to soak into things in a different way, but they were open to it. So what we basically designed, and I use that word design because you design a research study, you don't just spit out a research study, you design it. We designed a three hour in-home study. And that's basically what we did in plan. So we went to, because it was a pilot, we went to a subset of areas within the city of Boston. For those of you who are familiar, focused on Jamaica Plain, focused on Roxbury, really started there and decided, okay, this is a good place for us to start. And it was great because as we were doing this, we were learning. There were some things that were easy and then there were some things that were really hard. And we were noting those down at a meta level in this process to make sure that everything stayed documented and detailed. If we do a really good job in plan, we find the people we need, we think about how we want to engage with them, then it's a matter of really just executing on that. If everything stays organized, you find that you know exactly what's going on. You know that you need certain note-taking tools. I failed to mention that in plan, but we also put together the protocol and put together a note-taking structure, which was really important. And in Gather, we basically execute on all of that. Again, the challenge for the city at this point in time was they weren't sure how are we gonna actually elicit lifestyle stories. So I can't just go up to Dave and go, hi David, it's really nice to meet you. What's your lifestyle like? 
That's a really hard question to ask somebody, right? You can't just go up to them and sort of like, I played hockey growing up, you know, broadside somebody right into the boards. That's sort of what it feels like when you ask somebody that kind of question. So really important to understand, you have to ease somebody into that moment of articulation. You have to give them that platform where they feel that they can actually open up and share some of those stories. But asking a question to us, and this is, I feel like a bit of a differentiator for the way we do our qualitative research, we don't always just ask questions. Because sometimes questions are hard, hard to answer. So what we decided to do was anchor a lot of what we wanted to do in activity. Give somebody an activity, have them fulfill and complete the activity, and then say, hey, tell us what you did. And the fact of the matter is you're sort of deflecting some of your questions onto the activity, which made it so much easier for people to emote, because guess what? I don't know how you guys are, but if somebody asks me a question about my lifestyle, what's my first response? And I'll be thinking for a bit. And if they're an uncomfortable researcher, they'll be like, well, let me try to restate the question. And they'll cut in. And then they sort of break my chain of thought. And then, well, it's really hard. So by giving them the activities, it gave them that chance to really settle into things and go, OK, I finished this activity. Now let me tell you what I'm thinking. And it was a great segue into getting them to open up for us. Again, we had a very tight protocol, and we were very careful about making sure that the way we took notes was well done and was structured. Let's talk also just very quickly about that concept of transparencies that I mentioned in the beginning. Myself and my colleague Zarla, we went out as parallel teams, and as we do in all of our projects, we insisted that somebody from the iLab was there with us to take notes. And there's a big reason for this. We always feel like we represent the research acumen. We know how to do research. We love doing it. And we'll feel like we're quite good at doing it too. But what we don't know, and what we certainly don't profess to know, we don't have all of the domain knowledge that these guys at the iLab will have about housing policies, and what's the mayor's 2030 plan, and what does something mean if somebody says this. We don't have that depth of knowledge. But if you have the two of them together, and you bring them together, what you end up with is an excellent, holistic story. You have more than one person observing and absorbing a context. You have so much more than just the immediate of one person going out and doing research. Just as a rule of thumb also, never a good idea to have one person do research alone. Safety issues aside, but more importantly because guess what? back to what many of our speakers spoke to yesterday about that concept of bias. We never want to color what we bring back. We want to be very cautious of that. We are there to report on reality. And by doing so, we can't have any glasses painted on a different color. In terms of gather, we had a really fun bunch of activities. I put a few in here. So to introduce themselves, we had people do a collage about themselves. We want you to introduce yourself to us. Do a collage. For any of you who feel like, oh, do people do collages? Are they going to complain about it? They can think it's too weird. Believe it or not, these people were, they were fucking amazing. There's no other way to put it. They were just amazing. It was so awesome to see how well they embraced the moment and they really got into it. Because guess what? Now we're, instead of saying, oh, so tell me about yourself. And they're like, uh, I'm really cool. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a doctor. I work at the Mass General Hospital. We got much more because of stories that they could start to tell us because of their collage. We also asked people, I don't know if this thing has a little, I don't know if you can see this little red thing going up and down. Above you see a pair of boots, below you see a plant. We asked them to pick one item in their house that really describes them, that really almost frames the essence of who they are. And the boots were there, we loved this. Woman said she had all this stuff in her house, but she goes, those boots mean everything to me. And I'm like, wow, tell me about the boots. 
She had hiked up numerous mountains in Africa and Nepal and everything, and those were the boots that took her everywhere. She's like, that to me is just persistence. It's like, I can do anything when I wear those boots on. They're my superpower boots. Duly noted. The plant on the bottom, very interesting. This woman believed in the concept of community. She lived in Jamaica Plain, and down the street from her was this lovely old lady who had sort of been the mother of the neighborhood, if you will, old elderly lady, and everybody took turns helping this woman out, shoveling her driveway, cleaning her path, trimming her bushes, helping her if they had to lift something high up in the house. Everybody took turns helping her. And it seems the woman was always really interested in sharing things to keep the community alive. And so she gave this participant that we were with a cutting of a plant that she had had that her husband had started. He had since passed on. And when she gave her the cutting of the plant, she goes, I hope it grows and I hope it grows like our community. And it spoke to this woman. And she said, you know, this is what I feel is my essence. I believe in that. That plant represents me. If you had to ask somebody a question, you can probably imagine you're not going to get that kind of depth in an answer. But this is the beauty of hearing the human story. We also asked people questions and did activities around the spaces that they lived in. So you can probably see up top right, it looks like a nice comfy couch, a nice little den of sorts. And that den actually was fabulous because, believe it or not, that was somebody's dining room. That's where a woman, even though she had a fabulous dining table that seated six, in a thousand square foot apartment, which is really not that huge, that's where she ate dinner because she said, the dining table is only for my book club. I have repurposed the space and my husband knows not to go and sit there. So we were quick to move away from the kitchen table and moved over to a neutral spot in the house. But by having a house tour, by seeing how people had sort of repurposed their spaces, it was so interesting to see how people get creative. They're not looking for maybe the traditional, this is the dining room, and this is the kitchen, and this is the family room, and God knows what else. The bottom right picture, a woman who actually was a medical student. I'm sure many of you might know, but in case you don't, Boston is sort of a medical mecca of sorts. Lots of great hospitals, tons of medical residents and students coming through with, as you can imagine, Harvard and Tufts and Boston University Medical, all those guys just sitting right there. So this was a medical student, and she was in a tiny, tiny, tiny apartment. And for her, this was her study space. That was the desk that she studied at. And guess what? Hidden in the drawer was instant tea. She had her little kettle there. And if she had to stay up around the night, she had all of her flavors of tea. And this is where she chose to do it, because you know what? This is what she could do with the space that she was given. So we were able to get into so many different stories that people could share. This next slide actually shows a bunch of, I feel like this is like advancing really slowly, I apologize. So the next, there we go. So the next slide actually shows a bunch of the notes that we took. So just to give you an idea of how we put together stuff, the top left is actually a social graph. I don't know if any of you have ever used that, right? Where you have somebody talk about themselves, give characteristics about themselves, and then talk about their immediate family, and then maybe their community, and then maybe their neighborhood, and then maybe the city of Boston, and then maybe the United States, and then maybe the Earth, and then what's their legacy? And what it does is gets them to sort of start to expound on those details and sort of deconstruct those characteristics of what is and what means to them. We also had people do a little fun exercise where they characterized in the, in the top middle portion here, right up here, who they believe the different people are who live in their neighborhood. Who are those people and how might you characterize them? Do you believe there's enough of them? Do you think we should have more of these people, less of these people? Why are they leaving? What do you think? What's your perspective? All of these details that could, again, uncover as much as possible about what we could learn from these people and what they knew about the people in their environment. The bottom two, you'll see two circles that actually say necessity and affordability. And what we did was, I don't know if any of you have ever done, um, any of you watch Ellen, the little heads up game that she has, 
where you put a word up on your forehead. And if I'm looking at Kate and I go, okay, Kate, I've just got the word up. Obviously, I can't see the word, but they're going to deconstruct the word for me. And they're going to try and get me to guess it. And they're going to say everything they can. It was that type of exercise of what does necessity mean to you? What does affordability mean to you? And then what does it mean to you in the context of housing? So we stepped people into these details. Again, I'm going to stress the word designed. It was a design study because we were going after those goals that I mentioned in the beginning. If we move over then, we have all of these fabulous, fabulous details and data and notes and everything that we've taken. We now have moved over to the fun part. I like to call this the 2x part because in a lot of exploratory and discovery type research, it's really twice the amount of time almost that you spend in the field. It's a lot of time to deconstruct those stories. As you can imagine, because we had our stakeholders in the field with us, they were there during analysis as well. I cannot stress the value of that enough because I'll cut to the punchline. There's no guessing what the final presentation is gonna be then. They get to walk through every step with you. They get to see all the details of why you went this way, and then you took a right turn, and then you went, oh, dead end. Oh, no, come back this way. And you basically are walking around when you're doing analysis, and you're looking at all these different viewpoints. And they're privy, and they're part of why you abandoned certain points and why you embraced certain points. So important to have them there. Our challenge here again was they're like, oh, this was just so amazing, all these stories. Can you believe Anne's stories and Lewis's stories and all this stuff? But we know how to dissect quantitative data. We don't know what the hell to do with all of these stories. And we're like, that's a good point. We can help you. And the key is, is to bring structure to that as well. So what we basically did was had them in a really deep discussion of storytelling. And what we were able to come away with was an unpacking of physical and emotional needs. In doing so, yeah, we like two by twos, we like structures, we like spider diagrams, we like anything that looks like a diagram, basically. But the key thing here is, is that we really wanted to focus on the aspect of physical and emotional. So I don't know if you guys can actually see from where you're sitting. The left-hand side of the spokes says physical needs, the right-hand says emotional needs. And based on those stories that we were telling, and let's say I was to tell a story about Lewis, and I say a story and I'm like, you know, he seemed to have very high emotional need. My client who's with me, my stakeholder who's with me during that session, her name was Susan. Susan was like, you know, it's interesting you said that. I sort of heard a story a little bit differently. Can I share? And I'm like, yes. And what you do is you then get her perspective of the story. But she's heard the story, and she will be able to holistically take everything and socialize that story forward. And that value of everybody telling the stories together was incredible. But basically here, what we came up with was the following. We have context, which was where people live in what context, the neighborhood, the actual neighborhood that they're in, the agency of how much they felt they could or could not do, the people who surround them, and also the dwelling. We use the word dwelling, which is always a funny word to say. If you say dwelling a few times, it's really funny. After a few shots of tequila, it's even funnier, but we won't go there. So with dwelling, we were actually able to think about how people would term a, an apartment, or a house, or a condo, or a town. It really didn't matter to us. It was just where the hell you live. That's all it is. So it was really helpful for us to be able to take this. And what we did was, I don't know if you guys can again see with the contrast, you can see that there's overlays. And we took each person and overlaid them. And we found that there was some consistency. Their shapes were similar. And that told us a little bit about how these people were looking at the information they were looking at. Some of them were more interested in Finding a place and securing a place for potential and purpose, it was about serving a need. I am a medical resident. I am here for a short amount of time. It needs to be functional. It needs to be half a kilometer from the hospital. I cannot spend too much time on the public transportation. You see that there's like a, a slant of what they were looking for. Belonging and balance, somebody who's looking more long-term, somebody who wants to be invested in the neighborhood, somebody who feels like they contribute to where they live. And their home is part of a greater thing. It's not just 
a single entity on its own. We also had people who were looking for access and convenience. We had people looking for familiarity and authenticity. I'll never forget with the last one on the right, with familiarity and authenticity, there were people who had lived around the world and would come back to the same street that they grew up on to be faced by the same yellow house that was selling drugs, sadly, and had constant issue with the police. But they came back there because they're like, I'd rather deal with the problems that I'm familiar with than to go to some other place in the world where I don't know what the hell I'm doing. It was very interesting to hear those stories. And our goal was, we took each, as you can see on the right-hand side in the, in the sort of sketchy drawing, we took each of the details from the clients. And after we started plotting them, the clients got up and started plotting them with us. And it was very impactful for them to understand how to bring structure to some of this data that was so human-centered. Our last step is apply. And I love it because to me, apply is so lackluster. Basically, you're done all the hard work, right? Because if they're already there with you all the way through, what's the big deal about a final presentation? And in fact, very often myself and my colleague, we don't do that final presentation. We just go, hi. And then we hand it over to our client and they present to their own peers because it empowers them to keep that information internal. I'm not going to paint this pretty picture and say, this is amazing, guys. Oh, it's perfect. No problem. It always has issues. And socializing took time because people, we had people from everywhere. We have a, a head of resiliency in Boston. We have so many amazing people who are looking to make the city better and better. And we had people there going, this is just fabulous. But then they had to sort of figure out how it was going to work with their world. And that's not always easy. We saw pictures that Kate showed us of how all the different departments are there. It's not easy to bring it all together, if you will. But they were trying, and socializing took a little bit of time. There was discomfort. So I won't lie to you. There were calls from the client going, OK, I have a little problem. This person's wondering why we did this this way. Can you remind me why we did this this way? I'm like, sure. I'm coming back. Let's talk. But you shepherd people through their discomfort. You say, good for you for being uncomfortable. I'm so proud of you for saying that you were uncomfortable instead of trying to shove it under the table. Good for you. Let's talk about it. Go back to our data. This is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to see them through it and make them feel it's OK. But what we were able to do with this entire project was create that platform for research potential, to understand what qualitative research can actually deliver the value of the stories went so far. I will share that the city of Boston has done phenomenally well. They actually have created what we call UHUs, urban housing units, based on these concepts as we started. And actually, if you go randomly in the city, you'll see an urban housing unit just set up somewhere. And it says, come on in. And it gives you a chance to walk in and go, what do you think about this configuration? Walk in, check it out. Hey. I could live in something like this, not so bad. All right, yeah, and you can talk to people about it, and then off you go, and then they'll sh knock it down, and they'll come up with something else somewhere else. And it's fabulous because they're trying to make it connected to the people. Their goal was to connect with people, and their goal was to make this something for the people, which I really, truly do believe they were able to accomplish and are still accomplishing. So in closing, I think a structured process brought, first and foremost, a lot of rigor to something that is just hugely ambiguous. People look at you know, qualitative research and go, oh, oh my goodness, it's human shit. I don't know what to do with it. Well, guess what? It can be embraced. It can be understood. You have to be a bit patient. You have to go through those moments of discomfort. But back to some of the lovely speakers we've heard today, back to what Denise was saying this morning about creativity, with a good story, with a good story to spark that creativity. I know so many designers, you give them one good story, and they're flying in 10 different directions. But if they get charged with, you know what, you guys over there, you've got to actually go and create three more new products in six weeks and just come up with something, because we need to get it out because somebody's expecting something, it's completely useless. It's not human-centered it becomes meaningless to people. And then honestly, I feel for the designers who have to design like that, because then you hate your job. And I don't want people hating their job. They should love what they do. I really believe that a good story 
can set them off in a direction, and it gets them excited. I can only imagine that Anne's story got your team jazzed, and I'm sure there's many more stories seeing that you have a research team. So the city of Boston, very excitedly, has actually served as a model also to continue this human-centeredness. They've gone and spoken to other cities, San Francisco being the first one, Portland, Austin, Denver, people who have gone like, wow, you did this, wow, tell us about this, hey, tell us the story. And it's so lovely that they've been able to sort of be a model for including human-centered approaches to housing design especially. In closing, I just want to leave you with one thought. It's a lovely gentleman that we met. I mentioned his name, Lewis. He, it became so apparent when we actually had, and this was actually really fun for me because I actually had just come out of ankle surgery and I had a knee scooter, so if you can imagine, I'm like, like this the whole time, basically, going to all these houses. And this gentleman saw me and he's like, oh, come on in, you know, this is my place. And he was originally from Italy and then moved to Brazil and then decided that if he had to live in one place in the world, it would be the city of Boston. I'm like, whoa, okay, I gotta hear this story. And off he came and he started telling us and everything had a story. Everything had a story. And my God, it was all about his kitchen, which of course, as you can possibly imagine, spoke to me and the, I was like, oh, the angels are singing. It was fabulous. But the best part about it is at the end of our discussion that was so meaningful, he handed us his personal cell phone number and he said, you know, you're now part of my family and my home. And I want to invite you all over for dinner sometime. Would you accept? That's to me what neighborhood means. That's what community means. That's why I have this home. And that's why I have a kitchen where I can invite people in. I hope you will feel welcome. And honestly, I'm like, oh my God, I just want to hug you. Thank you. This is awesome. I just loved it. I was so happy. Lewis rocks. He's a friend now, which you love. And it's just another neighbor. So I just wanted to share that. I just wanted to say thank you to all the organizers of Amuse. You guys have done an amazing job. My Twitter handle is at Mina underscore KO. I love keeping it human. So please share thoughts with me. I will nerd out with you about research, and I am a bit of a snob about the structure, but come talk to me if you have questions. Thank you very much. Hello, Mina. Hello, sir. Thank you. I'm just going to sneak over here. Can I drink water? Um, lots of questions. Um, what was the compensation for a three-hour visit? That's a fabulous question, actually. So it was $150, and what we did was we did incent people um, $25 to do the homework. If they didn't do it, there was one, uh, there was one lady, um, uh, Gwendolyn, who uh, was not able to do the homework, uh, so she felt terrible, but her story was amazing. She was a two-time cancer survivor, had so much to share with us, so we were like, don't worry about it. We've got you covered. Let's keep on moving. But she goes, I got a story to tell you. And this woman was, woo, animated and amazing. So as you can imagine, lots of great stories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, how did you find willing test participants? And how did you ensure those participants weren't representing edge cases? So maybe this is more about sort of like how do you screen people? Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually going to correct the question and say this wasn't a test. This was exploratory research. It's so funny, I have to correct it because so many times people think research is a test and it's not. There's so many different varieties, so come talk to me if you want more detail on that. But how we found these people was actually based purely on income. That's all we could go by. Um, then it was their willingness to participate. We did, we did have a lot of challenge finding people and which is why partly we scaled it down to a pilot to make it more feasible in the time that we had. But what we did was basically put out notices, like sort of, you know, the old style notices in people so we can actually get to people who are non-digital. Um, we did go through a, a, an external recruiter to help us find people so that we had lists of people that they could go through who sort of fit the income criteria. And then we tried to do a nice base, you know, of gender difference, of, uh, uh, you know, family size, of square footage size. We tried to sort of balance out on as many factors as we could to get what we could think as an even split to start with. That, that's really a great point. So your team took special care to invite people in 
who weren't necessarily super digital and easy yeah. to reach on the usual channels. It is channels. so, so important to do that, so important. We did, again, this being the pilot, we learned that we have to do an even better job of that, so that was, and then something, if I can slip it in here that I, I actually failed to say in apply, is I noticed somebody called it a, a post-mortem, it must be a Canadian thing, we call it a sunset review a little happier, but um, basically looking back at everything you could learn and make better. And so we had copious notes from every phase mm -hmm. on what we could do better the following round. Cool. Um, about the collage, uh, we're wondering what, what do you bring into the into the house to prepare people for that? Like, do you have like a kit or like No, how it's a, that's a great, thank you for that. That's another clarification. There's so much to say. Um, the collage actually is something we just said, do it. So it was a homework assignment. Oh, I so see. we actually so, had them have it ready for us. Oh, so the participants select their own materials. They some people cut from their holiday cards. Some people cut from magazines. Some people took actual clippings of plants and stuff. And you do whatever you want to that describes you. But the best part about it was people were so, ver you know, varied. It yeah. told us something about all we care about. At the end of the day, it's not about what they did. It's them using that as a springboard for articulation. That's really what we're going after. So, sorry, now I have uh, my own question. <laughs> so, Are you allowed to? Wait I a guess. <laughs> I mean, MC powers activate. <laughs> um, so I'm imagining someone is excited to show you their collage. And you, as the researcher, cannot wait to see this thing. And then they show it to you. And I can imagine what I would be doing. Oh my God, wow. No. Um, how do you handle yeah. that moment of the reveal? Yeah, as, as animated as I like to believe I am, I'm actually very, uh, very calm. It's like walking the, the double yellow line in the middle of the road. You don't wanna, it's not about encouraging them and saying, oh, good job, because really there's no bad job. So why the hell say a good job? But when you see things, you say, well, I really wanna learn about this. Can you just get us started? And some people were just so ingrained in a particular aspect, or they had a flow that was meaningful. We're never to interpret any of that on our own. The goal is, again, for it to just be a way for them to emote with us. So if they can actually come up with a story that's important to them, that they want to share with us, really, at the end of the day, the collage has served its purpose. Mina, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much.